We're going to be talking to you about working with ROAR as a Crossref member, um, what you need to know. So let me start with um, just with um, a little bit of information to, to get us going. So um, if you've joined the webinar, you'll notice that you're um, that you're muted, that you're on silent. Um, but we'd, we'd really love you to take just a, just a moment to introduce yourselves in the chat. So let us know where you're from, so which organisation you're, you're based at or representing, and um, where you are in the world. I know that looking at the list of registrants, we have, um, we have folks from, from all over. So if you're joining from slightly outside your a comfortable time zone, then, then thank you very much. Also, we're making a recording um, if you're not. So, and we'd also like to know why you were interested in, in today's webinar. Um, why this is relevant. Um, and if you're not sure, hopefully we'll have enough information um, during the course of the webinar to, to let you know why, um, why we think this is so important for, for our members. Um, if you've got questions, um, you can ask those using the Q&A functionality in Zoom. I know we've lots of us have used Zoom over the past few years, so hopefully you're familiar with that but that will help us keep track of the questions that are, that are coming in. We might not get to all of them, but we will do our best. Um, as I mentioned, the session will be recorded and we will also share the, share the slides so that you can get any useful links afterwards. Um, and again, I know that some people will need an attendance um, certificate. So there's a form um, and we'll reshare that link again. Um, but if you do need one for um, then, then you can fill that out and we'll, we'll follow up on that. So um, in terms of the folks um, joining you, um, joining you today um, said, my name's Rachel Lamy. I'm head of strategic initiatives at Crossref. And I also, um, also work on rural outreach. Um, other presenters, I will let um, introduce themselves, but you can see we've got, um, we've got a nice um, spread of folks from across sort of organizations who are supporting and implementing ROAR. And um, Maria Gould, who's, um, who's sort of in, in behind the scenes mode today. Um, so I wanna make sure that, that you're not forgotten. And it's up to you to decide whether or not we actually look like our little, um, our little jungle avatars. Um, you can decide, I, I, won't, um, I, I won't pass judgment on that. Um, but just to say thanks to everyone for, um, for speaking today um, and Andrew, who's joining us from, from Hindawi to be able to present on some of the work that they've done. Um, we're going to we're going to run through a couple of things. We're um, we don't have tons of time to go into to what Roar is. There are lots of resources on the Roar website which already cover that in depth. Um, but we'll give you a quick introduction. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about why Crossref um, specifically is supporting Roar and the ways in which we're doing that. Um, we're going to see um, a publisher use some publisher use cases for Roar and a quick demo and talk about, you know, as a Crossref member, how you can how you can adopt Roar in your workflows. And then, as said, the sort of discussion um, Q&A and some useful links for for you all. So. Um, so, yeah, that's that's what we're going to we're going to run through today. Um, so, again, thank you for for joining us. And I'm going to hand over to Liz, I think you're up to talk to us about um, about what Roar is. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so my name is Liz Krasnarich. I am the adoption manager for Roar. I'm based at Datasite and I'm here to give you a quick overview uh, of Roar. We'll um, save the deep dive for another, another time since this session is really about working with Roar uh, along with Crossref. So we'll just do a brief intro to Roar and let's have the next slide, please. All right, so Roar stands for Research Organization Registry. Um, what that is, is an open community-led registry of research organization identifiers and uh, at least as importantly, associated metadata about those organizations. Um, ROAR itself is not actually an organization. Uh, ROAR is actually a collaboration between 
California Digital Library, Crossref, and Datasite. So it's kind of a, a new model in the uh, persistent identifier infrastructure area. Next slide, please. So when you think about ROAR, you might be wondering, why do we need another organization identifier? Uh, we had a few types that already existed before ROAR's launch. Um, so identifiers like ISNI and Ringgold and GRID, why on earth another organization ID? And that's a good question. So let's look at the next slide. So ROAR has a pretty specific uh, mission. We are specifically focused on researcher affiliations uh, to allow organizations and individuals to answer questions like, uh, you know, what, what researchers are affiliated with my organization or what research outputs uh, are associated with my organization. Uh, probably one of the most important features of ROAR is that it is open. So we want to connect organizations, researchers, and research outputs via open infrastructure, um, meaning that anyone who finds a ROAR identifier in metadata somewhere uh, can resolve that and figure out what organization that identifier matches up to. Um, in line with that idea, our registry is non-commercial. It's fully open, CC0 license. Um, we have a publicly available API that's free for everyone, and we have a publicly available data dump, um, and we release a new data dump uh, approximately quarterly. Um, aside from the technical aspects, we are also community-led. Um, so we have a community steering group, we have a community advisory group, and um, a, when we make decisions and changes, uh, those those are things we seek community input from. We also have a community-based curation model. So when users make requests to add new organizations or to update records in ROAR, those go through uh, a group that's made up of people from the, the community. Those requests are reviewed and the decisions are made about um, whether and how to integrate those changes into the registry. Um, so, ROAR is not necessarily a complete replacement for some of those other identifiers, Ringgold and ISNI, but it's designed to be uh, sort of used in the metadata exchange um, world. So you could use ROAR identifiers side by side, but really um, the use case that it's designed for is exchanging information about organizations in openly available metadata. So next slide, please. I should mention at this point, um, since we, we mentioned GRID, uh, as of this week, uh, GRID is sunsetting its public release and transitioning uh, the community curated uh, model over to, over to ROAR. So um, those who are using GRID right now uh, should be preparing to use ROAR in the, in the future. Um, can we get the next slide? So. The big picture overview of how ROAR is intended to work um, in research workflows is a research comes to an article or data set submission system that has integrated ROAR. They identify their affiliation from a control list that's based on ROAR. That ROAR identifier and affiliation information is included in metadata for that article or data set, ideally included in uh, DOI metadata, which then becomes publicly available to the whole world. Um, once that happens, it becomes easy to track and discover research by affiliation using that open metadata that's connected up to uh, ROAR identifiers and kind of linked to other outputs through uh, open persistent identifiers. Let's take a look at, a, at an example of how that works in the next slide. Um, so here's an example. This is actually from the Dryad uh, data repository. They have integrated ROAR, and in fact, they require affiliations for new deposits. You can see there's a nice little type ahead widget that's um, populated using data from ROAR. When users select their organization behind the scenes, the system is grabbing the ROAR ID. And then let's look at the next slide. Uh, Dryad then includes that metadata in uh, DOIs. So this is data site metadata. We'll look at the 
uh, cross-ref schema in a few minutes. Um, but Dryad includes the affiliation um, along with the ROAR ID in, uh, in the DOI metadata for every data set. And next slide. So once that affiliation identifier is in there, it becomes uh, pretty easy through uh, publicly available tools, through publicly available APIs to go in and find research outputs based on that ROAR identifier. So this example is from a tool called Datasite Commons. It's a search interface that um, the Datasite runs. It also has an API behind the scenes, but it's really designed to expose those connections between um, between outputs and organizations, as well as people. So it's um, using ROAR identifiers to, um, to search and grab those research outputs from that organization. So that is kind of the ideal workflow that we see for ROAR. The ROAR ID comes in, it gets uh, added into DOI metadata and then released out into the world in that DOI metadata so that, um, that systems and people who consume that that metadata can use those raw identifiers to, um, to accurately identify researcher affiliations. Hi, uh, I'm Ed Pence, Executive Director of Crossref. So thanks for that great uh, introduction from Maria and Liz. And, um, you know, uh, I think some of the reasons for why Crossref is supporting Roar have, have, have been covered about um, uh, the uh, wanting to have an open organization uh, identifier. But um, Crossref is really supporting uh, Roar in two different ways. It's one of the organizations along with uh, CDL and uh, Datasite in, 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 in operating it and helping run it, but also now uh, including it in the Crossref metadata and the, uh, and, and the Crossref system. Uh, but if we go back to, it was back in 2015, uh, where uh, Jeffrey Builder at Crossref uh, uh, defined the problem, and he, it was even before 2015, but uh, as, as the, uh, the third leg of the, the stool that was, that was missing from identification and metadata uh, within the infrastructure uh, that, that we were working on. So we have uh, content IDs, Crossref data site, and other registration agencies. Uh, we had uh, then ORCID come along for uh, contributor IDs, uh, but uh, the organization ID space uh, had, hadn't been addressed. Uh, and so that then uh, sparked off a lot of uh, uh, community work and community discussion uh, that uh, went, on, went on for a number of years. And then uh, it, it took a while, <laughs> uh, but it eventually uh, ended up with the creation of, 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 of ROAR uh, and then actually uh, Crossref adding it to, to, to our metadata and soon to be adding it to, to the output uh, of our, of our uh, REST API. So if we go to uh, the next slide then, I think there's some extra animations in there. <laughs> so uh, we're supporting ROAR uh, in order to have affiliations uh, identified with a unique open sustainable and persistent identifier. Uh, we think this will add value to the whole uh, scholarly research uh, ecosystem, uh, but it'll add value to the Crossref metadata uh, specifically and all the, all the people who, who use it and rely on it. Uh, and, and it's really one of our goals is to capture the scholarly citation record and what we refer to as the research nexus and the set of relationships uh, focused around, around content, but including um, authors. So we wanna connect publications, citations, uh, funders, grants, authors, and, and affiliations, and uh, that will enable uh, a lot of uh, good uh, practical applications, uh, which we'll be hearing about um, uh, shortly. Uh, so uh, uh, we found also with feedback from the community that, uh, that uh, the, uh, the users of the metadata, the users of the REST API, uh, have uh, rated uh, affiliations uh, second uh, after uh, after abstracts as uh, being um, what they'd like to see uh, in the Crossref metadata and uh, members, we've been talking about it for a number of years with our members and uh, at our uh, Live 19 meeting, um, we did a uh, prioritization of a lot of the different things Crossref was working on and uh, Roar uh, and implementing Roar came out as a, a uh, 
a, a clear top priority. So we are uh, now finally arriving uh, arriving at that uh, at that reality. So um, then, uh, but but I think yeah, we can turn to uh, now what uh, will be the uh, uh, practical. Uh, 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 use cases for this, the publisher use cases, uh, and um, uh, we want to connect uh, uh, submissions and 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 publishers want to connect submissions with institutions. Uh, this will help with uh, compliance with uh, funder and institution mandates and requirements, helping to streamline OA workflows, possibly repository uh, deposit uh, payments and uh, better reporting and and discovery, as uh, as was already mentioned. Uh, so uh, uh, it'll enhance discoverability, but it'll, it's not just, it's the cross-ref metadata, but it's also uh, all, all the other sources that can make use of this and all the other places that will be connecting uh, with ORCID, uh, sorry, with, uh, with ROAR and, and or ORCID is very close to, uh, uh, to supporting ROAR as, as well. So that's great. And as I said, overall, we wanna improve the uh, scholarly research uh, ecosystem. So in, in terms of uh, a use case, uh, I'm happy to say that uh, we have um, uh, Andrew Smeal from uh, Hindawi who has been working with uh, Roar for uh, some, some time now. So over to you, Andrew. Hi, hi everyone. Yeah, I'm really happy to be here. I'm Andrew Smeal from Hindawi or, or now Wiley, since we're part of Wiley. Um, and I work on, on building um, systems for, for peer review and, and um, uh, production in uh, publishing. And um, I'm, I'm going to show you, uh, uh, tell you qu quickly why we implemented Roar and show you a quick demo. Mostly this reinforces what um, Liz and, and Ed said already. Um, in, in our case, our immediate uh, need was to match um, uh, author affiliations to manuscripts um, for the purpose of working with institutions on uh, so, so libraries and consortia on centralized um, APC payments and reporting, uh, because increasingly um, the direction that OA is going is 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 in, uh, mediated through agreements with institutions. And in order to um, to know which institution to talk to about an individual manuscript, we need to know um, uh, the affiliation of the authors, and uh, relying on text. Uh, strings supplied by the author in a submission system can get um, can get really messy. You have to deal with all kinds of variations of names and variations of spellings and and blanks put in by mistake and things like that. And so, Roar looked to us like a great uh, a great solution to that, where we could provide a suggestion to the author of of the properly formatted and persistently identified version of, of that institution. It also makes uh, the submitting author's life a little bit easier, hopefully, because it's it's quicker to to select from a, a list of suggestions rather than having to type out the whole affiliation themselves. Um, and um, you know, it 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 um, the other thing that was really important to us was that Roar was open because the system we use at at Hindari is is called Phenom and it's an open source system we developed and we want to make sure that the system uses as much as possible open and community supported components so that it can be reusable for others. And so integrating Roar was just a, a great fit with that. So I am now going to try to take over and uh, do a quick demo. And it's not going to be terribly exciting, I fear, but um, it should be, um, it should reinforce what we've seen already. So hopefully you can see my, um, my browser. And uh, I'm on a um, uh, the submission uh, the the manuscript detail step of Hindari's submission system. You can see some dummy data that I put in here. And I'm I apologize for the siren. And I'm at the point of of entering an affiliation. And here on the right, you can see sort of the the um, developer console view in Chrome. You can see what's what's happening. I'll talk about that in a second. So if I I'm I'm in Brooklyn. So if I type. Um, you can see it's it's trying to predict what I'm typing as I go, which is cool. I type the name, and here at the top of the list is um, is Brooklyn College. That's what I'm looking for. Um, and if I select that, it's going to pre-fill the, the name of the affiliation. In our in our case, we also take a bit of the um, the address as well. And here, I'll just show you what we're getting from the API, which is quite cool. 
we're getting all kinds of useful information. Um, so we're getting a list of suggested results. So we can see, you know, we can see all those, those institutions that were ranked in that in that pop up and more. And for each institution, we can see things like, and I know it's, it's a little hard to see, I apologize, but you, we can see things like um, hierarchical relationships. You know, the fact that Brooklyn College is part of the, is part of CUNY, is part of the City University of New York. That's really good to know. So we can move up and down that hierarchy tree and we can see related IDs. So if we're, if we use ISNES and some other system, we can match to, to ISNES if, if Roar knows about it. And, you know, Wikidata IDs, grid IDs, of course, so, so that can be really useful. And we get information about location, um, country, city, all you know, really great stuff for reporting and, and uh, analysis later. Um, so you know, what's happening here is that the, the system is just making a really quick API call to the Roar API. It's not very difficult to implement. And um, as the author types in here, uh, it, it's querying the API for that text that they've typed. And it'll progressively query for more items, um, you know, as they type more letters. And then the API is making its best guess at, at which uh, institution is the best match and providing us a list of suggestions, a ranked list of suggestions. Um, um, so that's great. You know, where do we go from here? You know, this is this is implemented in our submission system, and I can show you some just very preliminary data, which is cool. You know, we we did this sort of towards the end of July. And this is the percentage of authors that uh, submitting authors or authors on submissions that have uh, a Roar ID affiliated with them. So we went from basically zero, a little bit coming from, from resubmissions, but basically none of the papers in May and June had um, Roar IDs affiliated with them, now up to 17% for submissions that are happening right now. So 17% of, of authors on papers submitted uh, so far in September, uh, have a Roar ID affiliated with them, which is great, so useful. Um, and we'd love to get that number higher. We wanna get that number up to 100%. And we're working on you know, improvements to the interface and, and uh, working with, with um, Roar and, and Crossref and CDL on how we, can, how we can keep getting that number up. But we're really excited about you know, the, how easy it was to implement and, and the data that we're getting. So I'll stop there. And back to um, back yeah, to you guys. back to me. Brilliant, Andrew. Thank you very much for the um, yeah. Thank you very much for the for the quick tour and sort of explaining um, why Roar is um, is such a good fit for um, for what Hindawi are trying to are trying to do. Um, I'm gonna sort of um i'm going to take a few minutes just to to talk a little bit from the um from the the cross perspective in terms of um in terms of sort of how we see this um how we see this kind of broken down into the the various stages of the workflows that our members use um you might have seen a, a blog that we that we um that jenny hendrix wrote a few um a month or so ago um, and this image features because what we want our members to do is manage metadata to look up and identify affiliations from Roar, as Andrew just demonstrated. Um, we will then, um, I guess, kind of do the rest in that, um, as Liz explained, that, that part about distributing the Roar identifiers as part of the metadata um, to, to anyone who's interested so that they can be integrated into tools, services, so people can discover, track, and make connections between, between research objects. So let's, I wanna break this down into, um, into a couple of distinct parts. So um, I, I saw from a, lot of the, um, from a lot of people who were joining the webinar, um, I'm, I'm going to give us I'm going to give us a big tick for the first piece. So, um, you know, you join Crossref as a member to be able to register metadata um, for your articles, preprints, book chapters, grants, all of all of that, and including those um, related identifiers um, where relevant. So, um, Ed already mentioned things like ORCID IDs, links to data, um, all of that. So. Um, Affiliation information is is always, um, as Ed explained, is something that that was was kind of missing or 
um, a bit a bit limited if you just if you just collect a text string of information on affiliations, which is what what we've done in the past, then you run into all of those issues that Andrea explained about in terms of having to try to reuse data that has gaps in it that's inconsistently entered. Um, there can be a couple of names for for an institution which um, which Roar accommodates, um, but it does mean that being able to just type in a name and, and and find all of the the outputs related to to an institution was just it was just impossible, um, and that's something that increasingly folks want to do. So, looking up and identifying it, um, affiliations from from Roar and adding those into the cross ref records. Um, at a very simple level, if you want to, um, if you want to find the um, the Roar ID for something, you can um, you can go to um, the the Roar search interface. We'll give you links at the end, and you can see the Roar ID that's um, that's associated with uh, with an institution and other related identifiers as well. In case you do have a grid for something or a, a cross ref funder ID, um, but. As both Liz and Andrew have shown, we, we, don't, we don't really, um, you know, expect people to be going in a one-to-one, one-by-one basis and going and looking up the, the Roar ID for, for each individual author. Um, I think, you know, for the, what we've tended to find is that um, those kind of integrations, um, like we were showing, really sort of help our members be able to integrate Roar into, into submission systems. Um, the, the Roar API can be used to help an author find their institution, and that then matches it to the Roar ID behind the scenes. And it's useful for many of our members who use open journal systems that a Roar plugin is available in the OJS 3.3 plugin gallery. Um, that adds support for collecting author affiliations and Roar IDs. Um, but it doesn't yet support including raw IDs in the DOI metadata, um, but work is planned on that soon. So I think I'd acknowledge Julep and the, the folks at TIB in Germany who've, um, who've done a lot of work on that. And we're also talking to different manuscript submission system vendors um, about integrating Roar as well. Um, as said, um, you can also match existing affiliation information in your systems. Um, using matching tools or existing DOIs with, with, with Roar IDs. Um, again, there's a wealth of information um, available um, in the Roar support documentation, which Liz has put together. So that's a really nice place if you, if you want to roll your sleeves up and, and, and start, to, start to really think about how to, how to get going with this. So if you've got, um, you've got Roar ID, the Roar ID, you've got the affiliation information, um, then the next step is to, to make sure that that's going into the metadata that you're sending, you're sending Crossref. And this is a little snippet um, from the, um, just some example metadata to show where Roar is, Roar IDs are collected within, within, our, within our metadata schema. Um, so in this instance, um, the institution is repeatable, so you can enter multiple institutions. And we also, you can see we support a couple of, um, a couple of affiliation identifiers, um, but for our purposes, um, we, we recommend and, and support Roar as we've, as we've explained as part of one of the supporting organizations and because of the, um, the things that, that Roar supports um, and the fact that it's, it's openly available and we're part of that community. So that's kind of the, the nuts and bolts of how to get it into, um, into the metadata. Um, so said about um, five or six weeks ago, um, we added the capacity to be able to, to add um, raw IDs into the, the Crossref input schema. So, so into the metadata so that members can register that with us. And that's across all of the, the different content types that we support. Um, I've taken a little snippet. So ARDC in Australia had already started to, um, to register Roar IDs within their um, the grants that they're registering with us. So um, you can see University of New South Wales and their, their, their matching Roar ID is being submitted to us. Um, I'll talk about next steps in a second. 
Um, but we currently support the, um, the registration of ROAR IDs via, via XML. So if you're uploading XML to Crossref, so if you're sending that to us programmatically, or if you're uploading that via our admin tool, then you can provide um, ROARs as, um, as part of your, your X, the, the XML that you send to us. Um, my colleague, um, Sarah Bowman, um, has um, wrote a blog uh, again a few months ago about some of the work that we're doing on our other content registration tools to make it even simpler for um, to make it simple for for our members to register sort of key metadata with us. And um, so as part of that work, we will be supporting Roar in sort of a new suite of simple content registration tools. Um, when they when they become available is that we're, we're putting a lot of work into those at the moment. Um, and as said, the, the thing about Crossref is that, you know, the identifiers and, and metadata are really the start of it. The, the key benefits come whenever that information is, is disseminated um, to the community. Um, we've been doing a lot of work internally to, um, to provide better support and stability for our, our APIs, which are used by thousands of institutions all around the world. Um, so now that that work's coming to a close, um, we'll be um, we'll add um, we'll add the raw IDs that members are registering with us into our APIs over the next over the next couple of months. Um, now that our our API code freeze has been lifted, we also want to integrate Roar into other tools, services, and reports so that our members can see um, how how many you know, if they're registering ROARs with us, um, to what extent. Um, so something that, you know, again, is a, um, like Andrew showed, how, how many ROAR are IDs are people submitting with current content? Um, and our participation report service, um, which highlights sort of what we would see as key metadata fields, they'll be expanded in future to, to show ROAR so that you'd be able to go and look at a glance and see how, how complete the coverage is within, within a publisher's metadata. Um, we know that um, some of the funders that we're working with um, might, um, might want to might want to register, um, use ROAR as an alternative to, to a funder identifier, um, specifically for, um, for funders who aren't registered in the funder registry, or maybe because there's something like a facility um, or something that isn't listed. So um, we're going to support the capacity initially in the grant schema to be able to provide ROAR IDs as an alternative to funder, to funder IDs. And I think just um, continue to provide um, sort of evolving support for Roar, both as an organization, you know, in, in terms of support um, by, our, by our staff um, and with our infrastructure, um, but also sort of continued technical support as well, which is really kind of key um, to, to being able to, being able to um, successfully collect and disseminate this information so that everyone has better information to be able to, to assess research outputs and be able to to more effectively support the flows of information that they that they need to um to to, to make the exchange of information more more efficient and, and less work and less manual data entry for everyone which is something that we would we would all like um, that's a pretty quick run through so um, we wanted to leave time for um, for discussion and um, and Q and A, and we'll also sort of share a few um, useful useful links towards um, towards the end of the webinar as well. Um, Maria, I think you've been sort of manning the manning the Q and A. Um, if you're able to to help us kind of parse through those. Yeah, sure. Uh, I and, and, and many others are, are jumping on and attending to the many interesting questions. Thanks everyone for your engagement and interest and enthusiasm in everything that we're talking about. I wanted to start, I know that we've we've addressed some of these already in, in the Q&A box and you can see them in the answered tab of the box, but one of the questions that has come up a couple of times that is relevant for Roar and Crossref is, um, questions about the relationship between the Crossref uh, funder registry and ROAR. And there are a number of questions about that, about the relationship and 
between them, the distinction between them, and plans to potentially merge them in, in the future. So I thought maybe just for the benefit of the whole group, we could reiterate some of some of those responses on, on air. And I will with, uh, call on Ed uh, first to address this, and then anyone else can chime in. Yeah, thanks. Um, so the Crossref uh, Open Funder Registry uh, was developed uh, quite quite a number of years ago uh, in order to enable uh, publishers to uh, capture and provide funding information. So it was very specific to uh, uh, funding uh, that was associated with uh, with publications. Uh, so it identified the uh, the funder. Um, funder name, and so uh, we developed that based on um, uh, data that was uh, donated by Elsevier, and we've maintained an update and kept that up to date. We'll continue to maintain and update that. Uh, Roar has developed uh, subsequently and has a broader uh, use case. Any any organization really involved or that that might be an affiliation in publications or or involved in. Um, the whole scholarly research ecosystem. So, so it's a it's a broader set of of, of data. Uh, there's there's a mapping from Roar to to the Open Funder Registry. So you'll see those IDs in the Roar Registry, uh, and uh, the plan would be uh, eventually uh, for the um, Crossref Open Funder Registry to sort of uh, be be merged into fully merged into merged into Roar, uh, but uh, we'll keep maintaining it until that happens and we'll we'll announce anything well before we make any changes because a lot of publishers use the open funder registry as part of their workflow systems and we don't want to change anything too quickly on on that front so uh, uh we, the publishers should focus on uh adding roar to the mix and then we can we'll sort out the open funder registry later thanks Ed. Anyone have anything else to add about under registry and ROAR? Um, I mean, from the technical side, there was a question about whether uh, organizations have both a funder registry ID and a ROAR ID, uh, which Ed answered to say yes. Um, for those that those organizations that have a funder registry ID, it will it is included in the ROAR record for that organization, uh, so it makes it relatively easy to map between the two. And we do have some. Uh, some scripts and some examples about how to map uh, one ID type to another on our support site. Yes, thanks, Liz. And the slides that we will be sending out to everyone will include links to this information. Okay, another, another question that came up a few times that I know Andrew already addressed, but it might be uh, worth bringing, bringing up again, um, because I know it's of interest to this group is this question of, of identifying affiliations uh, during the submission process. And there's a question around temporality and uh, whether the affiliation field should be the current affiliation or the affiliation uh, from you know the time the research was conducted for instance and I know this is um, something that has come up in some other some other circles and so I'm just wondering Andrew if you want to say a little bit more about how you how you thought about that in your implementation well in our case the um... The way it would work is that the um, an author um, would have might have a user profile in our system, and at that user profile level, they have a current identity that they that they might maintain that includes their their orchid and things like that that are uh, associated with their uh, with their user profile, and they they have a, a a form in our elsewhere in our system that I didn't show where they can update their user profile information change. Um, uh, change their affiliation, and that that would also use Roar, but that would be stored as, at the, at this user profile level. But on a manuscript, we treat an author's affiliation on a manuscript as an attribute of the metadata of that manuscript that doesn't change over time. So the uh, there are some exceptions to that, like name changes, for example, do, we do support. But um, uh, so an author, uh, if an author submits a manuscript or publishes a manuscript from a certain affiliation. Um, and then goes on to change their affiliation, we wouldn't update the Roar ID 
of that particular manuscript, but we would update the RAR ID of their profile if they told us about it. And that's consistent from the, the data site side as well with, with data sets. Generally, you want to capture, I mean, it's and it's important to capture the affiliation uh, at the time, you know, that actually goes with the, the data set or manu or manuscript since um, that has important uh, reporting applications. Yeah, great, thank you. All right, so there are a few questions that have come up around the, the granularity of, of ROAR. I can just quickly jump in. We've mentioned uh, in the Q&A box that ROAR is really focused on, on what Liz and, and Rachel were describing as identifying you know, these connections between research organizations and the research outputs that they are associated with. So ROAR is, is by design really focused on capturing top level affiliations. And that means you know, independent organizations and not going, going deep into the subdivisions within a specific organization. Not that that's not important, but that's just not the particular use case that ROAR is trying to address. That being said, there are some there's some basic relationship metadata available uh, in ROAR that came inherited from GRID, so parent relationships, child relationships, and related organizations. Uh, so that means that there is, you know, that, that level of, of granularity that you might expect to see um, at this top level, but, but not, not more granular than that. I know that there are some specific questions about this group of organizations or, or you know, a particular use case, it's, it's hard to address on air how that might be handled in ROAR. So I, I would suggest that this is something that's really best addressed through the community curation process um, to share a specific use case for capturing, capturing specific, um, you know, specific types of related organizations and uh, we, can, we can review it through the community review process. Maria, do you want to speak just briefly about um, what that community curation process consists of? There were a couple of questions about how the how curation works generally. Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. So uh, as, as Liz mentioned, we built the ROAR registry with seed data from the grid database of organizations. So that was ROAR's starting place. Uh, and so what we have right now in ROAR is a copy of what is currently in GRID. Uh, just this week, um, GRID released its final public release. Um, they had announced in July that they were going to be sunsetting their public data and passing the torch to ROAR. Um, the plan all along uh, when we built ROAR was that ROAR would um, always become an independent and community-led registry. So ROAR was always planning to be independently curated and independently maintained. Uh, and so now we're at this um, official, official point where um, we have synced ROAR and GRID one last time. And um, going forward, the two registries will begin to diverge. Uh, and one of the reasons, you know, one of the reasons why we, uh, why it's important for, for ROAR to be an independent uh, registry is that we want to make sure that the um, broader community of, of ROAR users and ROAR stakeholders has input in, in, in the, the, the data that ROAR has. Uh, so we have developed uh, an, an approach um, with input from community members through, um, through calls and webinars uh, to, um, to seek community input as part of the decision-making process to determine which organizations need to be added to ROAR or which metadata changes need to be made. So this is something that we began piloting back in uh, early 2020, and we have been expanding it um, as part of a grant-funded project with the Institute for Museum and Library Services. And um, basically what it what it means um, in practice or what or what we're trying to do is um, establish a, a common set of criteria and policies that um, that can be used to apply uh, that can be used um, to to help make decisions about organizations that are being added to ROAR or uh, metadata records that need to be changed in ROAR uh, and help to um, 
uh, you know, to, to involve a group of people in, in reviewing those changes. And that's a little different. Um, some of you who might be familiar with ORCID know that um, it is an individual, you know, researchers responsibility in, in most cases to be maintaining the information in their own ORCID record. And it's a little different in the case of ROAR where we don't have um, one person from each organization in ROAR who's responsible for maintaining that organization's data. Um, that's not really scalable for us. It's really not something that uh, that we received input um, as being important or, or necessary. A lot of the information that that we have in ROAR is publicly verifiable information like where the organization is located um, and things like that. So um, we wanted to make sure that we could have um, involved community input in the ROAR curation process, but also make sure that it um, could be relatively, uh, you know, relatively efficient to manage, um, given that we are doing this in a kind of lightweight collaborative way. So um, there will be some some links that we can share out and I'll post in the in the chat box where you can start to um, follow along and see what kinds of requests have been coming into ROAR and how some of the decisions are being made. This is what we're building up right now as part of this transition with GRID. Uh, so there will be a lot of um, a lot more work to come as we um, finish building out ROAR's independent infrastructure to support registry updates and registry curation overall. So looking at some of the other questions, again, thanks to everybody for asking all of these things. I know that there was one question, it was, looks like it has been addressed, but there were some questions about documentation on the Crossref side and examples. And so it looks like the Crossref team is working on that to support their members. Uh, so that we we can send that we can take that as a well I, I know that we've already taken it as a follow-up action but um we can also add that information to the um to the slides and um so that you get that whenever we send out the the slides and the recording um over the next week or so great thank you maybe i'll just pose um as we're coming up on time you know, maybe something for, for Crossref to address, and I suppose ROAR as well. Uh, it's kind of come up in, in some of the questions, uh, you know, looking at, there's a question to Andrew about um, how, you know, why they chose ROAR versus another option, and kind of like to pose that to Crossref as well in terms of how does ROAR fit into this bigger how does ROAR fit into this bigger landscape or bigger ecosystem around open infrastructure and, and open identifiers and open metadata? It would be great to hear Crossref's perspective on that. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'll answer that. Uh, so Crossref uh, adopted the principles of open scholarly infrastructure uh, at the end of uh, last year. So, so we want to uh, as much as possible uh, support uh, support open infrastructure. And so in looking at uh, an organization identifier, uh, you know, we wanted to support something that would that would uh, uh, be useful for our use case, but but also be open and sustainable and, uh, you know, be consistent with with our adoption of the uh, the POSI principles as we uh, uh, refer to them now. So I think I, th I think that was yeah, one of the one of one of the main reasons, and um, you know, in in the uh, uh, sort of a trajectory, as I mentioned, uh, in in the work that's been going on for the last few years, there were a lot of organizational uh, ID meetings and discussions over the last number of years, and at one point there was a a, a, a sort of a ass assessment of what already existed, uh, and Grid was identified as as one of the best candidates, and then. Digital science uh, made it CC zero, so it was a, a, a great way to seed uh, the registry in a community governed uh, uh, registry. So I think those are some of the main reasons why, at, at a high level, uh, we we wanted to uh, uh, support and use ROAR. And so uh, we do accept uh, uh, Wikidata IDs and uh, ISNIs uh, in in the schema and the metadata as well. But we're going to focus on ROAR as the, the best practice for, for affiliation identifiers. Mm 
Thanks, said. Anyone else have anything to say? We can mention all of the various resources that are available, and I think we have most of the links on that that slide. Um, I, from the Roar side of things, um, I do want to highlight the guide that we have to including Roar identifiers in DOI metadata, which is on that slide, but also I'll pop it in the chat. And I know that CrossServe is still working on some of the documentation for the the latest schema release. Um, we do also have the Roar technical support discussion group, which if you're implementing uh, Roar is a great place to get all the latest, um, the latest news and updates. Um, so I do really recommend subscribing to that because that is tends to be the first place that I post new uh, tech updates. Cool. No, that's that, that sounds great. And as you said, this sort of very active um, in and around Roar, very active community groups, adoption groups, um, and as you said, technical, technical discussion. So, and I think one of the reasons for, for holding the webinar today and um and getting your questions is the fact that, you know we're you know we're, we're always kind of learning the the kind of questions that that folks have and the things that they're coming across whenever they whenever they start to implement roar so um so questions are very welcome and then we can we can all kind of um supplement our our documentation or or look into them or or figure out you know sort of ways that ways that we can help um ways that we can help with that um so I'm I'm conscious we're we're coming to the we're coming to the end of the the session today. So as said, just to um, reiterate, thanks to um, to all of the the panelists and to Maria um, and to the other folks who helped sort of behind the scenes um, to be able to pull this together today. Um, thank you for coming and for um, for all of your your great questions and participation. Um, more to come soon keep an eye on our on our blog and the various roar resources and um do take five minutes back at the the end of the hour to to have a break before your next meeting or to to finish up for the day or to or to start your day but thank you again and um we'll be in touch with follow-up information very soon thanks goodbye <laughs>